Good morning, everyone. It is a Saturday morning, just after six o'clock. I am headed to the warehouse for some extra hours. So, another time for monologuing. So, last night I just had a fantastic gig, just as a duo, and that's usually one of my favorite kind of gigs, especially as a bassist, because when it's just when you're accompanying a singer who plays guitar and you get to play bass, there's a lot more space to fill. And he also plays harmonica, which is a great thing, so it's not like I have to play solos every song. But yes, as a bassist, I get to do solos. So some of you bassists that are really just wanting to, uh, you know, play beyond just functional bass lines, it's like, yeah, man, find a solo artist that needs a bassist in learn songs that's a very good thing and I mean the great thing about being a bassist is that if you're accompanying people there's a lot of songs that most people know and if you go out there enough you'll understand which ones people tend to learn a lot but uh yeah pay was good tips are fun there's pretty ladies there Although we weren't a full band, so there were probably more people off to see other shows. But, uh, yeah, just a lot of fun. The only downside is <laughs> I think I agreed to work because they're Saturday shifts. We voluntarily sign up. So I signed up for this Saturday weeks before I think I even got offered the gig. So, and fortunately, the venue I played at is five minutes from where I live. But what sucks is like I was at past. I got home around one. And I just woke up at five. Well, I set the alarm for five, and then I just kept snoozing until five forty-five. I had just enough time to drink a cup of coffee and then get dressed. Fortunately, I work in a warehouse. Today it's going to be pretty busy, but uh, I'm going to do a recording session after work. Because the nice thing about these Saturdays, I only work till 10.30. Yeah, it's 7 to 10.30, it's extra hours. And essentially, we just need someone there to uh, load installers with jobs, you know. Because I work at a flooring company too. You know, so there's all kinds of tile, thin set. All kinds of stuff. And, you know, throughout the week, we stayed at the jobs, get ready to go. Uh, but, yeah, it's good work. But the recording session I'm looking forward to, because our drummer, she, um, actually, she's been, she's been out for a while because she just had hip replacement surgery, you know? But, you know what? We're all still good friends, and it's nice that she has a lot of real good recording equipment for this band to play in. Um, I think for, for, for professional reasons, and I'm not going to say the name of who I'm recording, but uh, I'm going to lay down my bass parts. But I'm also bringing my own recording machine. Because i got to shower some stuff I've been working on. And, yeah, music, you got to just gotta keep going. That's how you're going to find fulfillment. I'll admit, this time in my life, I just think I was reaching peak exhaustion. You know, because a lot of my life, you know, I have to wake up at 6. But then I try to still go to the gym after work, too. And then if I need to eat dinner, which you should, you know, I'm usually not done with my day until 8 p.m. or maybe even 9 p.m. So then by then, I'm like, to have enough time to work on music like you know you can always find time to fit in you can always find time to fit in stuff and nice thing about monday i already got scheduled another practice session and that's what it is you just fill up the calendar and hey there's a lesson for some of y'all uh i learned that it's really good to have a calendar yeah because you can't just keep all those deadlines in your head you are going to forget and then you just look like the idiot 
constantly asking everyone, hey, are we doing this? It's like, you should always ask to confirm, but you shouldn't be asking to make sure you know what it is, right? Uh, but I digress. Ooh. I don't even know where I was going with that. And uh, I do like these early morning drives because there's no one out here. As I swear, in this town, I mean, this is a country town, but we've got kind of a major highway that runs past it. The road I live by, it goes across the major highway. And, oh man, certain hours of the day, just packed non-stop. But you just got to plan around that. And hopefully some of y'all, if you're really struggling, I'm hoping I can part some kind of wisdom just to keep going because it's like I'm not here to say that my life is glamorous or anything there's hard work but you know what you just don't give up because there's always there's always a chance for more and you can always work at improving yourself you know? lesson I've learned the worst thing you can do is if you feel miserable is just to sit around feeling more miserable yeah I said in a previous video, you know, you got to take action, and I've really taken that to heart. Um, I watched a video recently. It was about this whole aspect of just kind of the BS of manifestation and all that. I get, I, I see a lot of women post that on social media. It's like, I need to just manifest this, you know, and my thoughts, I'm going to put it into the universe and it's going to make it for me. It's like, well... That's cute and all, but you really have to take action. Because ins inspiration doesn't just come to you, man. Inspiration comes when you're doing something really great, you're on top of your game. That's when it comes to you. Because some of my best music moments, they didn't happen to me when I was just sitting around depressed, hoping I'd come up with that great song. It's like, no, it's when I'm doing what I do best. And out of the fluke of nowhere, all of a sudden, it's like, ooh, ooh, that's nice. My best ideas come to me when I'm actually active. Like, even when I'm just at work, operating a forklift, right, and trying to move all these pallets, and I think a melody in my head. And that's the frustrating thing, trying to remember it by the time you get home. And yeah, I'm sure a lot of us go through that. You think of this great idea, but you can't record it, you can't jot it down, because you're, you know, you're at work, right? And then by the time you get home, you forget it. But then the next day, you're at work again. You're so busy, all of a sudden, it comes back to you. I'm like, oh, you know. Hey, man, that happens. But they're just ideas. But that's a big lesson, man. Because it's like, when you feel like giving up, that's really when things actually are about to change at times, too. Like, if you're putting in the work, man, just do not give up. Because I'm looking back at myself from a few days ago, I'm looking at myself now, it's like, yeah, today me is wishing I could go back to a few days ago, even me like, dude, it's gonna get better, because, man, I had a great gig last night, I mean, uh, playing a duo is one of my most favorites, it really is, because you really have to fill in the space, and it's great working with an artist who can just nod at me to signal, yeah, man, go take a solo. He doesn't really have to say anything, you know. And I'm just on. I'm following him. And I got more stuff coming up. And I want to say to those of you musicians that really feel like giving up, you know, it's like, don't. Stuff's going to come along, man. You know, I never would have thought... 10 years ago that now I'm playing gigs and making money yeah and it seems kind of late you know like oh 25 we're making gigs it's like here's the thing man 25 I was still doing the whole I'm gonna play in a band and we're gonna start gigging but at the same time I have all the stuff I want to work on but no I was just working I was working at a grocery store then just coming home, recording stuff. But at least I was still doing it, you know? Because now, here I am later, I actually have recordings that I can put out. And I do have another channel. Um, 
I did years ago. It's inactive, but I did upload a bunch of stuff that uh, I recorded over 10 years ago. So if I remember, I'll try and put that YouTube channel. I'll link it in the description, and y'all can... Uh, there's already some music I did from, you know, 25 year old me, back when I didn't really know anything. Back when I was first starting to record. I got some Beatles instrumental covers, I some Bach, some Weather Report, they had some originals. And some of those originals, they're gonna make it back to the album because I recorded them pretty poorly, but there's a lot I love about them. I mean, those original recordings I did over 10 years ago. Those are like my babies. That's when I was really first learning. And even if they only have a few dozen likes or uh, views, like, I'm still proud of them because I can look back. When I show them to people nowadays, I realize it's just a lack of marketing. And the main thing is I couldn't really play drums. So you can tell that it's not quite in time. But I'm still proud that I did it. Uh, maybe I should talk about recording. So, my original recording that I did, they were on a Fostex. But, since then, though, I've been using a Tascam. And, it's that Tascam digital 8-track player. It's a very, very great uh, tool, really. It's kind of like my own little electronic journal. Because even if I don't release songs, at least I've got them down. I've got them saved on a memory card. Um, oh, there's one song song I'm really excited to be putting on my album. I think I just need lyrics for it. But over a year ago, me and one of my bandmates, he was playing drums and I played on bass. I think we were just, we recorded some, some of his stuff. But then, you know, we were like, hey man, let's just jam. So, I made a file, started recording. And then I got on bass, he got on drums, and we just kind of jammed out like a three minute bass and drums jam. And I actually kind of forgot about it. Yeah, but it was just kind of bass and drums. It was all on time, because we're playing live together in his garage. And we recorded it, and I kind of forgot about it. Like, I didn't ever really listen to it again. I just had it. But he came over to my new place about a few months ago, and we were working on some recordings, and then I'm going through the song files, it said bass 016, that's what I had saved it as, like, what's this one? I play it, and I'm listening back, I'm like, wow, this sounds really cool, and that's the great, that's a lesson about recording, it's like, you need fresh ears if you're really trying to record something great, because you could think you record something great, but if you're constantly at it, you need to give your ears some rest. Because there's times I've done recordings. I'm going all at it. I've been at it all day. Right? And I think it sounds amazing. And then I go to sleep. I wake up the next day. And I'm like, oh, this sounds terrible. But that wasn't the case with this one recording. Like, ah. I was like, there's something to it. So then a few weeks later, I'm just sitting by myself. And I was actually home sick for a week. But one of the days when I didn't feel like throwing up, I listened to that track again. I was like, man, I just got to put some guitar on it. And I finally did. And you know, the track, all it's missing are some vocals. It needs someone singing, right? And that's the recording process, man. There's little gems that you recorded a long time ago, but you never put out. And it's like, this could really go with something. I mean... Lots of bands did that. Led Zeppelin's one of my favorites, right? Because they did um, Physical Graffiti, their double album. But they had songs on that album that they recorded from previous recording sessions from years ago. There's stuff from Zeppelin 3 and Zeppelin 4 and Houses of the Holy. So that's 1970, 1971, 1973. That made it onto their 1974 sessions that eventually became Physical Graffiti. And it's like, uh, so Tascam I highly recommend, because I've had this machine for many years now. It's real simple to use. I recommend getting the 8-track, because that gives you enough room to work with. You can use a 4-track. I know my brother, he's got a 4-track, and he does some great recordings. Um, but the 8-track one is real simple, because you can record all this stuff on separate tracks. 
without having to worry about getting into the whole thing of bouncing tracks over and having to make more make room for more so an eight track recorder that's generally a good thing i recommend and it's not like that has to be the professional thing it's like Use that for collecting your ideas or getting some good scratch tracks down. And then whenever the opportunity of going into an actual studio comes up, at least you have those recordings, bring them into the session. And especially if it's like an, on an SD card or even just a CD, give it to the engineer. And you're like, all right, I got this and I want to record a song off of this. my recording process it's actually pretty simple because I really have never been a fan of the overproduced sound right like I was raised on classical music and that's where you know especially if you go see some a classical music performance you know it's these incredibly gifted musicians right from the very first downbeat to the very last downbeat they're playing a whole song and in classical music if there's multiple movements you're not supposed to clap between movements Right? So there's... But I love that feeling of... You can tell when a track sounds like it was recorded live versus in the studio where you recorded something and then they just looped it or they cut and pasted. You record something, but then you had to... Oh, this one little thing was a mistake. Let's just go back and just record over this one part. Which, nothing wrong with that, because people have, you know... Ultimately, it's the sound that you want to do. But me, I'm personally of the fan where if you get an entire track for an instrument from the very first downbeat to the very last, I like a continuous track under uninterrupted because I like it. I like that live sound because there's little nuances because you're not going to play every note perfectly the way you practiced, right? But when you're doing a track non-stop, you get those little nuances that you really can't just recreate it. But there's little feedback. Maybe when you hit a note, your finger was kind of resting on another string, so you get kind of a little buzz. All little stuff like that. And um, so that's what I love about this track I recorded with my bandmate. I was on bass, he was on drums. That track sat there for a year. I listened to it again, I was like, this just needs guitar and some vocals. And it doesn't, it doesn't really need anything else. It's a very bare bones track. No overdubs, like I love how the guitar part came out. I even fit in a solo, but it's very, uh, I don't know. I can't wait till it goes up on the track because I'm real proud of it. I did some wah pedal, a little bit of tremolo, and uh, Anna. If y'all remember this video I'm posting today, and then you hear my album whenever I release it, hopefully you remember what track. Actually, it's going to be the last track on the album, and that's kind of how I'm kind of thinking. I got this album in mind, but the very last track, like this recording that I did, all it needs is some vocals. It could be an instrumental, but it's like, nah, it needs, it's me in terms of my ideas it's really missing some vocals uh and that's the hardest part for me like the hardest part for me as a musician is i'm terrible with lyrics right i hate memorizing lyrics now the artist i worked with last night jimmy martin what he does he's actually got a tablet and so but he he does hundreds of songs right because it's almost impossible to remember so many songs unless you've played them for years. And even if you played them for years, you're going to mess up, you're going to forget lyrics. But he has that tablet because sometimes people will request songs, so you can just look it up. you look at me, you know, and I watch his fretting hand, but I also watch the tablet. And I can actually see at least the chord names, so I can jam with him. But the cool thing to an audience perspective, they have no idea that we've never done the song together. We just go for it. We play it, and people end up liking it. And, uh, so hopefully that's some tips for some of you starting musicians. You know, I think I'm kind of like a, uh, what was it, a middle-aged musician, whereas I'm not quite a seasoned pro where I've done it for decades, and I'm past the point of being a beginner, right? So I'm kind of in the middle phase where um, I 
I'm still always improving. You know, but I remember what it was like being a beginner. And you're kind of like, I get it, you know. You would love to be able to do that for a living. And I tell it to you younger guys because your most important thing is that spark that keeps you going. Because in recent years, I felt like my spark is gone. Right? But a lot of it has to do with being overwhelmed by schedules. And especially if you work, and then you're working with other people, and you need practices, you need to learn songs, and all of a sudden a gig pops up last minute, so there goes your day to work on your own stuff. It's exhausting, because sometimes, you know, for me, sometimes what I learned that whole week of being sick, it's like, man, it would be nice if I could just be home all the time, and all I had to do was just record, you know? And at some point, that can happen, right? Because there's always opportunities out there. Yeah, and it's like, there's open mic nights, and there's always musicians that need other musicians. You know? But I still stress that point. It's like, go to open mic nights. Because you'll meet people. It's a great networking opportunity. Like, I've gotten gigs because I met someone at an open mic night. And they liked how I played. And it's not even that I was the best. It's not that I didn't mess up at all. It's they like how I played. And that's what it comes down to. And um, it's a real blessing the more people you meet. And... Yeah, learn to listen to other people, too. Because we all got that ego as musicians. We do want to show off. We'd all be like, well, here's me. But, you know, learn to accompany people. Because you need some humbleness. Because an ego will only get you so far. Now, if you're a total virtuoso where no one can play like you, I mean, yeah, there's that chance that you can get that shot. But at the same time, man... We live in a different world now. We don't live in the time of the guitar hero. There's lots of guitar heroes out here. There's a lot of wannabe guitar heroes. But you know what's really cool? They all need a bassist. And uh, you can pick and choose who you want with because, I mean, there are a lot of guitarists. And I'll poke fun at y'all because y'all poke fun at bassists all the time. But a lot of y'all are stuck in the past. Dude, like, I'm not na- gonna name this guy because I get it. He has a dream. I'm not gonna cut him down. But, you know, he's middle aged. He still. He definitely has a show prepared, but it's like no one wants to play with him every time he would show up with those open mics. Because he's like. He's trying to be exactly like his guitar hero. He's like, yeah, man! Rock and roll! You know, but no one wants to list him because he's. It, it's just guitar masturbation. And those of you that are much more seasoned pros, you know, you know what I mean. It's the one guy, he's just hoping he gets his big break. So he shows up at the open mics with his big half stack. And he's like, really loud. It's like, if it's too loud, you're too old. But it's like, no. For you serious musicians, you need to learn to play to a room. Because I've met a lot of guitarists. They play so loud. But no one can really, no one wants to hear it, Right? That's the thing. You gotta play to the room because at the end of the day, you're playing for people. The majority of people don't know anything about music. They really don't care about your journey. All they care about, the moment you get up on stage, the moment you leave, you're the, you're performing. Right? And it's not just if you know the songs and if you play every note correctly. People want to be willing to listen. You gotta play to the room. And unfortunately, I've met some acoustic guitarists they turn their PA way up, so there's all this feedback, and it's just, ah, uh, it's very off-putting, you know. I mean, there's a reason where people that are playing before you, they'll listen, but, you know, especially if you're that, ah, uh, I don't know what to call this kind of guitarist. It's where they're so loud, and they just cannot, I don't know, they, they're just not self-aware to realize like dude just turn down a little you're not playing in an arena you're it's not like there's some record executive who's just sitting there he's gonna see you i'm like here's my card we gotta get you in the studio because you're a star you, you gotta get that mindset of that man this is the 21st century 
you know, music has changed a lot. Yeah, man, like, learn to play to a room, because you'll get more opportunities that way. You know, um, Jeff Beck, I want to point out, I guess this is my final thing, Jeff Beck, I want to point out, he was the ultimate guitar hero. Because we all know the stories of those musicians who were stars, they burned bright but fast, right? Jimi Hendrix, he put out three albums, but he died young, you know? All those guys. But Jeff Beck, he had a long career. And he wasn't as famous as Jimmy Page or Eric Clapton, but he was my favorite yard bird, man. And as much as I grew up listening to Zeppelin, I really prefer Jeff Beck as a guitarist. Because, you know, Jimmy Page... I don't know if it was the heroin or John Bonham's death. He really hasn't done much since Led Zeppelin. And while Clapton is a good guitarist, my favorite Clapton was in his, he was in Cream, right? But he, he is a really fantastic blues guitarist. But Jeff Beck, he was all, like, you cannot imitate Jeff Beck. And I've got the live of Ronnie Scott's DVD. I've got a few of his albums. I got Blow by Blow on vinyl. And, uh, yeah, Jeff Beck, I bring him up because he did pass away. He died at 78. But he was always, always the supreme guitar hero. And big props to Johnny Depp. He got through that whole Amber Heard ordeal. But he played in a band with Jeff Beck. I mean, I listened to 18, that album they did together. It's like, that sounds awesome. And... Yeah, Jeff Beck is the type of guitar hero everyone should really aspire to be. Because after he passed, what is he known for? He's known for being a one-of-a-kind, fantastic guitarist. And he's got a great uh, car collection. That's all he's known for. Right? And his place in music history, it's cemented. Because all these great guitarists... They all talk about how Jeff Beck is still number one, man. And, um... Oh, man, I could do a whole video on Jeff Beck. But I think I, I want to give a shout-out to... Yeah, the legendary Jeff Beck. He was one of a kind, and what I loved about his playing... He played it like it was a vocal instrument. And every little nuance that he did. Vibrato, or feedback... And he played so melodically, his phrasing. He never showed off, but he could. But, um, uh, yeah, he's going to be incredibly missed. My biggest regret as a musician is I never got to see him play live. I would have loved to see him play live. Because I'm obsessed with that Ronnie Scott's DVD. That's when a really young Tal Wilkenfeld, uh, and apparently she'd only been playing for two years. I was like, wow. I had been playing longer than her. And man, she was already better than me. And it's like, that's what I mean. There's always someone better than you. And you just got to admire that, man. And just the look at that girl's face when the band is just on fire. And man, whole band. And I, I was reading. And it's like when she first start, got that gig, she actually stayed with Jeff and his wife. And so they're having band practice. And Jeff's wife, she would comment on songs and everything it's like oh man so he had a loving relationship so it's like I don't know anything controversial about Jeff Beck I mean there's a video of him when he's in the Yardbirds Jimmy Page too it's in this movie called Blow Up his guitar's experiencing all these noise problems so he just smashes his guitar on stage that's a cool video check it out it's called Blow Up um, with the Yardbirds Yeah, and you gotta look to those people for inspiration. I mean, don't get me wrong, Zeppelin put out some great albums, there's some great live footage, but dude, they got into all kinds of drugs, and their drummer died. They couldn't go on anymore. And that's one of the tragedies, you know, because they were the biggest band in the world. But once you're at the top, where can you go? But Jeff Beck, it seems like he was always reaching the top, and he was... You gotta admire that, man. You just gotta admire that. And I'm just in awe that I ever got to... I even discovered his music at all. 
I'm at the 30 minute mark, so I think I'll leave that with y'all. But until next time, have a good one.